Welcome to the Next Level Casino Careers Show, a series highlighting industry tips and insights from the best minds in the casino and hospitality industry. Enjoy the show. Melanie Johnson, good morning. How are you doing today? Good morning. I'm great. Thank you, Kyle. Melanie, thanks for joining as the Director of Human Resources at Sam and Will Band of Mission Indians. It's a big title. It's a big role. Um, I know you have a lot on your plate. So thank you for just taking you know, 45 minutes today to chat with uh, me and the audience today. And I think a lot of people are going to learn uh, for your expertise. So just thank you for joining today. No, I appreciate the opportunity and um, I'm happy to be here. So Melly, we always like to start and provide context on who the individual is. And we call it the three minute origin story, you know, like where you grew up, what were maybe some early interests and kind of the early days of what ultimately was your career. Kind of tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Okay. So I, I probably have one of the most unusual origin stories out there, I guess. Um, uh, I grew up at, on a Marine Corps Air Base. Um, both of my parents were Marines. Uh, and um, I think that shaped a lot of how I approach things, right? So I'm maybe a little more matter of fact and straightforward um, than uh, most people um, because of that. Um, I didn't want to be in HR growing up. I actually don't know anybody who says that, right? So as a child, when you ask people, what do you want to be when you grow up? Nobody says, I want to work in restaurants, which is where I actually started my career, or that I want to be in HR. So I kind of fell into that. Um, uh, when I was going to college, I studied entomology. And I, so I have a degree in entomology with a chemistry minor. And um, I, I'm a geek, um, but I'm really a science geek. Uh, and uh, that's just something that I was very passionate about, and I still am today. Um, but while I was doing that, right, I needed to live and uh, and pay my rent, and I worked in restaurants, and I found that I loved it. Um, I loved working with people. Um, insects don't talk and interact with you <laughs> in the way that people do. Um, and then I discovered something that I didn't realize, I guess, um, uh, early on, and that is that you can make a living doing that. You can make a living working in restaurants. It's not a throwaway job. Um, and the hospitality industry isn't a throwaway industry that you just do while you're trying to figure out what you really want to do with your life. Um, so I be kind of I became passionate about that. Um, I started working with the National Restaurant Association, the California Restaurant Association, and really advocating for hospitality jobs. Um, and that they are careers. They could be more than just a job. They can be just a job too, and they're great for that, but they can be a career. And um, there could be um, a way to make a, um, you know, a life out of hospitality. And it's interesting and fun. And um, there's, uh, there's benefits to working in, in this industry. So I don't know, that's my quick uh, spiel, but uh, I worked in food service for most of that time. Um, and in fact, I think my current job now is the only job that I work at where I'm not um, solely focused on the food service um, industry. Um, we have food service, of course, at San Manuel, but um, there's other things too. So I think this is insightful. So when you when you first got into food service, at that mm -hmm. time, did you look at it as just a just a job? Just you needed to make some money. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at: at what point did it shift to being a career for you? So when I started, I'll tell you, I started at Knott's Berry Farm and I was little house on the prairie dress standing in ghost town. And my sole job was turning over this roast as it, that was on display to make people buy these roast beef sandwiches at the stand standing behind me. It was a part time summer job. I won't tell you how much I made because I will tell you how long ago it was, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was a long time ago. And um, I was really just going to do it for the summer, right? Um, something that I still take to this day from that job, though, was that it became a career for me because people showed interest in me and um, and started to work with me and, and and saw some potential there, right? And I don't know how they saw it because I was very shy complete geek nerd at, you know science was my thing and i was a high school junior and um you know they did things um uh, to develop me they helped me um i worked in the staffing trailer at nosbury farm and interviewed people i don't know why they thought i could interview people because i could barely talk to anybody but by the end of that summer having to interview people you know 12 to 15 people a day every day for three months 
I got to where I am now, or I could talk to anybody. I joke that I could talk to the wall for an hour, right? Um, that I just, I, you, I, you, I developed that skill because people invested in me. And so that's something that um, really has become one of my core values today is um, investing in people, helping people to figure out, you know, where is that intersection of what you love and what you're good at and how can you have a job doing that? Um, that's when you really find success for me. That's, that's what I think the secret formula is. What do you love? What are you good at? Find a job that caters to that and you'll be very successful because it won't be like a job. It'll be fun and interesting and, um, and very fulfilling and you'll get a lot of satisfaction out of it. And by the way, you'll bring a lot of value to the organization that you're working for um, because all of those things are coming together for you. But that's where I found it when I was a 16 year old kid in ghost town um, working and uh, people took an interest in me and helped me. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate. And there's a couple things I want to come back to. You said, I don't know what they saw in me. Mm -hmm. but now, if you really had to pinpoint it, what do you think it was that they saw in you to invest that kind of energy in you? I think looking back now, I think they saw that um, I I was very, I'm, I was very conscientious, right? Um, and maybe it's for, coming from that Marine Corps family that um, I, I had focused, I really wanted to do a good job, right? So whatever was given to me, I wanted to be successful at it. So I wanted to figure out like, what it took to do that. Um, and that's advice I give people right now is, um, you know, when you're given a job, even if it's not your dream job, figure out how to be good at it. Um, so that, um, and learn something from it. I, so I, I really believe that every job that you're doing can teach you something, even if it's not your dream job. And I've had a lot of non-dream jobs, right? I, the job I just described is not a dream job, probably for anybody. Um, I worked nights at a grocery store, um, as an adult person with kids, um, to make extra money for my, you know, my daughter to go to college. And, um, uh, that's not a dream job, right? But I learned a lot um, in both of those scenarios and other jobs that I've had that, you know, I wouldn't say are dream jobs. You can, um, you know, you could develop yourself and learn things from that um, by trying to do a good job. So um, I think that that's what people saw in me was that I, I had this drive to do a good job and um, and to learn um, from everything that was presented to me. So. I, you know, I took in whatever anybody gave to me and tried to learn from it and um, make myself a better worker from that experience. You said something I kind of want to pull on, especially mm -hmm. your position and the expertise that you have, dream jobs. Because a lot of times there's kind of these two ends of the spectrum. There's a lot of people who say you need to find what you're passionate about. It needs to be passion, passion, passion. And other people kind of go the other end and just be like, you should actually just really focus on the job that's in front of you. And through that, you might find your passion later on, or like it's a, more of a mindset with the position you have on your spectrum, because I think that's interesting. Kind of where do you sit is because I feel like a lot of people, a lot of younger people or people just in general might have a little anxiety because they would say, I don't know what I'm passionate about. Right. Yeah. And I, I hear that from young people a lot. Like, I don't know what I want to do. So like, how do you advise people on that question, well, I need to find my passion versus maybe just taking that step into a career, just open any question, take it where you want. How do you advise people on that? I, I think, I think you put too much pressure on yourself when you say find your passion, right? Like that's a big, I don't know if, if anybody really finds that. And sometimes those things change. I don't know if there is like one passion, right? So I kind of flip that around a little bit and say, you should bring your passion to whatever job you're doing. Um, I don't think your job is your passion. I think you have passion for things and you should bring that uh, um, all the time. So, you know, if I'm bagging groceries at the grocery store at night, uh, that's that non-dream job I just mentioned, I can be passionate about that. I can be passionate about how I interact with people and the customer service I provide, and I can bring my passion to my work. Um, it, it's a lot like uh, um, when people say, you know, I need to find what makes me happy. You know, you should be happy <laughs> and bring that with you wherever you're at. So you you bring that. that um, that's something that you bring to the table. So I, I don't think you should necessarily look for your passion. Um, I also think that... Um, that people expect their um, like their passion is a goal, right? Um, 
you know, something I talk to my daughter about a lot is that it's it's not about the destination. It's not about finding your passion. It's the journey that it, to get there. And if you're always looking for the next thing to make you happy, um, you might never be happy. And then you'll look back and say, I just did all this stuff where I could have been happy in that, right? So if I'm saying, oh, I'll be happy when I get this job, or I'll be happy when I can make this much money, or I'll be happy when I earn my degree, or well, while I'm doing all of that, why can't I be happy like in the process of it? So there's a um, there's there's a there's processes and a journey that happens, and you can be passionate and happy at every step in that journey. Um, and you know, don't let one thing like a um, like the job you're doing or the the place that you're at in your life define um, your happiness or your passion. Right. So I think it should be the other way around. You can bring that to the table and not look for something else to give that to you. I love that. I love that. And I wrote that down. You should bring your passion. And I do. I, I really think not to go far off the spectrum here, but I but I think what you're saying is something I can kind of relate to, which is happy. There's always so much you can control in your life, but what you can control is your mindset, mm -hmm. right? Your external factors, your job. There's always gonna be things thrown at you, but to the best of your ability, your attitude, what you bring to the table every day. And then also too, I love that you hit on like enjoying the journey. Mm -hmm. When you're in it, sometimes you don't appreciate it. But then when you look back, like when I look back to my early jobs, it was a really fun time. Right? Yeah. And I tried to appreciate it at the time. But now looking back, I gained some valuable insights that I didn't know at the time that helped me now. Right. Yeah. So I want to ask that question to you. So in those early days in your career at, um, is it Knoxbury Farm? Mm -hmm. That was my and first job. Yeah. Just throughout the restaurant and hospitality industry. What were some early lessons that you learned that you still apply today? Oh, gosh. I think um, one of my main lessons was that every job has value. And um, and and I, I didn't maybe realize that at the time, but in looking back, right, and I realized it even more today, that um, there's no um, job that's more really more valuable than another job. Um, so when you work for a place like an amusement park, Nasbury Farm, or like uh, you know Yamaha Resort and Casino, where there's a, so many moving parts, um, it really takes all of those moving parts to make that thing happen. And so uh, if, if you have the job that, you know, is not the high level job, you, what you think of as your dream job, so you just are coming in at an entry level position, that's a needed role. Um, and uh, that's an important role to that place where you're working. And so you shouldn't, um, uh, you know, discount that and feel like you're not valuable. Right. So something I really try to convey, um, I, I try to convey this to the people on my team, to the um, team members I interact with, the leaders I interact with, my daughter, right, who's 22. And, I, you know, I there's things I look at her and, uh, that I wish that she knew. Right. I view her as kind of a younger version of myself. And the number one thing is how valuable you are um, and that you can bring value in whatever job you're doing. Right? There's a reason why that job opening exists is because they need somebody to do that job and you could offer that. Right. So um, don't don't shorten, you know, don't sell yourself short and discount the importance that you have. So I, I wish more people feel valued uh, or felt valued and that they could recognize that themselves. Um, so I think that's an important thing that leaders have a responsibility to do for the teams that work for them. But I also feel like uh, I wish people would do that more for themselves, that they're they're valuable in whatever they're doing. And it's not it's not a throwaway job, no matter any job that you have. Um, you know, that's why you should be passionate about it and uh, do your best job at it, because it's important. Um, you said something that uh, our CEO, Lawrence Vosloo, said, which is provide value where you can. And I think that is so critical and worth a double click because I'm sure like you, you probably get hundreds of this talk of mentors and how do I take my career to the next level and then I want to get promoted. And I really think in its simplest form, it's where can you provide value? Maybe it's a new project. Maybe it's a new system. Maybe it's something real simple, guest service standard, whatever it may be for your position. There's mm -hmm. always opportunity to provide value and just go find it. And usually 99% of the time it'll be recognized and that'll put you on the upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's such a simple thing, but it's funny because he said it and you said it. And I just think there's so much value there. Don't you think? Yes. 
and, and ironic that you said there's so much value, right? And finding value, but yeah. um, but <laughs> or, or giving value. Uh, I I I think there is, right? Um, so I mean, don't focus so much on the progression and where you could go. Focus on doing the best job, right? And I think it's the second time I've said this, right? Focus on doing the best job in the job that you have, um, and then that is really something that it that is valuable to the organization that you're in. Um, that's what will be recognized. Okay, so now I want to jump a little bit, Melanie, to your role today. If you wouldn't mind connecting the audience, how did you become the uh, Director of Human Resources for uh, Sam and Band of Mission Indians? And um, a little bit about your role, if you don't mind sharing. Oh, yeah, sure. Gosh, so by the last organization that I worked for, I worked there for 23 years. <laughs> so uh, that's a really long time. I did many different jobs there, uh, but that's a long time to work for one uh, for one place, right? Um, and so I really started thinking, um, you know, what else could I do? Um, uh, is there an opportunity for me to, um, you know, look around and see what else is out there? Sometimes you get so involved and stay at, um, you know, one place for. Uh, it's such a long time that you don't even know what else exists outside of that. Um, and so I just out of curiosity started looking around and I, I don't know uh, what in the universe caused it to happen, but I found the position um, of manager of learning and development at San Manuel and um, applied for that. Um, it was, like I said, I don't know what I did right um, in the universe, but uh, it, it came at the perfect time. I joined San Manuel as the manager of L&D um, right before um, COVID happened. Um, I actually worked at San Manuel for a week and a half, and then wow. everybody was sent home <laughs> and worked from home. Wow. I jokingly said when we came back to the office, I'm not going to know who anybody is that I just worked with for over a year, uh, because I, I, and, you know, unless I close my eyes and uh, and listen to you, I won't know who you are because I've never met you in person. Right? I had only met my core team that reported to me, and that's it um, in person uh, for over a year. But you know. San Manuel was such a great place um, to work for and really took care of team members during that time. And L&D was a great function to work in uh, because it was a way for um, San Manuel to stay connected to team members um, and you know, provide engagement opportunities uh, during a very difficult period. Um, so that was um, a, a great opportunity for me. Um, I progressed to the director of learning and development probably after about a year. And then um, there was an opportunity to move over still in human resources, but to become uh, the director of the people services area of human resources, which is where I am today. Um, this this role kind of really calls on a lot of the past experience that I had outside of San Manuel. And uh, I'll tell you, honestly, this is the first place that I've worked where I've been in human resources. Right. Every other place that I've worked, I've been in operations, but he, operations is human resources. Um, and I think that's um, that's what I bring to the HR department here is that um, when we are interacting with people, we're interacting with people that are doing operational work. <laughs> and so to come from that background of having worked in operations, I really understand that. I understand the business. I understand um, the individuals that are contributing to the business, the value that they bring, um, how uh, you know my role um, plays into that. And that, you know, my role is really to support that and to help the operation to be successful. Um, so whether I'm in the tribal government side or the Yamava uh, Resort and Casino side, it is um, uh, really to support um, their goals and objectives and make sure that, um, that we engage with our team members in a way that can help everybody to be successful. You know, I want the business to be successful, but I want our team members to be successful too. And I think, uh, we're the most successful when all of that happens. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to I want to get to that in a minute as far as, you know, retention, you know, tips to, for future leaders, first time managers. But I am curious to know, because I think this is helpful for the audience. A lot of people can probably relate whether they stay with the same company or kind of the same area for a long time. And there's some loyal longevity there. But maybe there's an inner pool of maybe I'm ready for something different whatever the reasons might be, looking back on it, making that switch, any tips you would provide to someone who's thinking about making a jump either to a different industry or just a different company? Uh, any thoughts looking back on it? Yeah, I would say, you know, 
it was it was difficult. Um, I it, I joined that uh, company when they were very small, and I really helped them um, to grow, and they helped me to grow. Right. Um, so you know, I was operations manager for a long time. I, I ended up in learning and development, so that's the transition there um, with them. But uh, you know, working um, and putting all that energy into helping them grow, working with the founders, um, there was just so many relationships that happened there that made that um, a very difficult um, transition. I think what um, propelled me forward and kind of moved me to make the transition was, you know, realizing that those same things could happen somewhere else too, right? That's not the only place that they exist. When I when I talk to people on my team, um, you know, I've had people on my team apply other places, whether it's within San Manuel or not. Um, I really, um, I encourage people to move towards something, right? So if you can move towards something that is exciting for you, for, uh, you know, is an opportunity for you, is something that could help you to grow, I'm all for that for anybody. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we have a lot of those opportunities here at San Manuel. So uh, many times team members are looking to move and do a job like that here. But even if it's not here, I, I want people to do that. I'm very passionate about that growth and helping people to be successful. Um, I always say, though, don't leave to get away from something, right? Because those same things you're going to go get away from also exist at your next place, too, because it's all people. And people really... Uh, you know, people are everywhere. That's who you're going to work with. And they have the same great things about them and they have the same challenges about them. So, you know, never leave because um, I don't like this person I work with or I don't like this team that I'm on or right? so the negative leave is um, is is challenging because I can guarantee you those same things you're going to find at whatever place you go to. But the positive leave I love. So if you find a new opportunity and it's something that will, you know, help you grow and get you excited about it, um, I encourage that, right? So let's figure out ways to, to make that happen. And, uh, you know, even on my own team, I'm happy for people when they find that opportunity. But, you know, my role in HR is to address the reasons why people leave negatively. And I hopefully that's what you're going to talk to me about with retention. But um, that's always, I don't know, that's a... It's always disappointing to me if people make a choice for that reason. So if you're thinking about leaving, I would encourage you to look, um, you know, just do a little self-reflection as to why you're leaving. Is it to get away from something? Then I try to more work on, like, can I fix that thing I'm trying to get away from? Would I, do I really need to leave for that? But if it's to go towards something, I would encourage you to do that. That's, that's move towards something, go towards something. Mm. That's perfect. And I want to come back to something you kind of touched on it, but if you had to fill in the blank, the main function of my role is blank. I think the main function of my role is to help people to be successful in their jobs. Um, and I, I know maybe it sounds cliche because that's probably almost everybody's main function or every leader's function, right? Um, but uh, that's really what I try to do. Um, I work with a lot with the leaders um, uh, in uh, in the organization, and I really want to help them to be successful, help them to have um, successful interactions with their teams, help them to um, uh, you know uh, meet their um, uh, performance goals. I I want them to meet their own uh, personal career goals. I to, to help them to be successful and to. Um, uh, to do what they need to do in their role. I have that same goal with my own team. I want my team to be successful, right? Whatever that looks like for um, for them. I want to be successful, right? So personally, um, I uh, I want to do that too. So to foster success is, um, I think that's the function of HR. Um, we are a partner, right? Um, and our role is, is a support function. And in that support function, um, we should be helping to make people be successful. And on that front, maybe it's simple, maybe it's hard, but let's try to narrow it down to three things. Oh, gosh. So if you had to say, advising anybody, a manager, supervisor, whatever position, it might be a little different, maybe not. But if you want to help people be successful in their job, what advice would you give to managers? If you only had three tips to give them, maybe it's one, maybe it's two, maybe it's three. But anybody out there, a manager, I want to help someone be successful in their job, people who work for me. What would you advise them on? 
if it's a leader, the number one thing I do and that I tell everybody to do is interact with your teams. Um, and if you think you do it now, do it more. <laughs> uh, uh, that's uh, the number one thing um, that a, a team members come and talk to us about. Uh, that's the root cause of challenges that they have. It's the number one challenge that leaders have is not knowing um, you know, what's happening on their team, not being able to see problems early and address them right away. And a lot of times it's, you know, I get it. You're busy. I'm busy too. Um, and that's hard, but to, the more you can get into your team and work with your team and work next to your team. And uh, that, that has to be by far in a way, the number one thing that I suggest people. So you need to get to know the people on your team and, um, the best way to do that is to be part of it. I'll tell you that when I first came into this people services role, right? So um, we have um, certain groups that we support, depending what side you're on. One of my groups was the Department of Public Safety here at San Manuel. And I never worked in the Department of Public Safety. I don't know, right, what that is. Um, and I want to be a partner to them and support them. The first thing that I did was go and work in, in the department. Right. So I went to our uh, dispatch and on a Friday night for five hours, uh, uh, you know, uh, participated in what calls they took and how they interacted. Um, I went on a, a patrol ride along. I went to the gun range and they taught me how to shoot like all of those things. Um, just because I then when in, uh, you know, the leaders come and talk to me and when team members come and talk to me, I understand the job that they're doing. And that's why I, I would encourage leaders to do the same thing. I encourage the sergeants in that department, go and work with your officers and see what they um, are encountering at their posts and the challenges that they have and talk to them. They'll tell you stuff. They didn't know me when I went in there and I'm from HR, right? So everybody's like, I don't know if I want to talk to her, but they talked to me and I learned a lot about that department by working those shifts in there. And I would encourage people to do that with, um, with any department, with your own department. And maybe it's been a while since you've uh, been, you know, in the trenches with your team and you can learn um, some valuable insights on that. Maybe you haven't worked, you know, at, at, for us graveyard uh, in a long time. Come one night and uh, and see what happens and what kinds of challenges that um, they encounter um, that maybe the day shift doesn't. Right. So I don't know. I, I think that that's so valuable. And then. I get made fun of because I always use the word secret agenda. I always have a secret agenda, which is not as bad as it sounds, but the secret agenda um, uh, or secret benefit that happens from that too is that you can network with those um, team members and build some relationships. And um, you know, your team members work, if you're a leader, they work for you. They don't work for Yamava Resort and Casino. I mean, technically they do, but they don't know I, um, any leader other than the leader that is in their department. And that's who they work for, right? So, you know, our cooks work for their sous chefs. Our, uh, you know, uh, individual contributors work for their supervisors. And so getting to know that person and interacting with that person, I think, goes a long way towards retention, but also goes a long way towards understanding what's happening in um, your department and being able to build an effective team and help those people to be successful. Yeah, it's great advice. And I know also too, it just goes a long way to your point, you know, understand, understanding that you have the importance of no matter what the position is, it goes a long way when the leadership shows up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess the part two of this question would be, I want to talk a little bit about retention. So mm -hmm. from your vantage point, as far as keeping good talent, keeping good people, what do you think or what tips would you provide on that end as far as trying to keep people within an organization, something that leaders, managers, supervisors can do? Um, maybe maybe simple things, maybe big things, but any tips you provide as it relates to retention and keeping good talent? Yeah. I think one of the things I've learned is that it, it's not the big things that the organization does. I mean, yes, people love them and right. And, you know, I'm happy that we do them here, um, but it's really the small things and it really um, has a lot to do with the engagement of leadership. Um, so all the things that I just talked about, right. I think that is um, one of the keys um, building relationships with people um, so people can feel connected. I think the other thing that I hear people talk about a lot and I think is important is helping them to see a future with you. Um, if people see a future, then 
there's a reason for them to stay, right? So finding out um, kind of what their goals are, what um, uh, you know, what are their career aspirations, and helping them to move towards that, um, I think is, is important. Um, so conversations I like to have with my own team are, you know, uh, finding that information out, and then outside of the team, I can advocate for them and for those opportunities and um, and for the things that they would need to do that. Um, but if I don't know what those are, then um, sometimes we can make mistakes in uh, how we advocate for our team, right? I have in the past advocated, you know, for a team member to move to a new role and not knowing that they didn't want to do that role, that didn't fit into like their idea of what their career path would be like. If I had talked to that individual, right, I would have known that and um, I would have been able to um, uh, advocate for them better. So I think that's an important component. Melanie, um, any tips on how to have that conversation? Because I think what you're saying is so valuable there. Um, you know, I try to understand, you know, what, because I feel like everyone's career aspirations is different. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people are fueled by growth and they, they want to be promoted. Others try to seek work-life balance. Others don't know and they just want to make the most out of every day. So, I mean, it, it varies, right? So any tips you'd provide on anybody to... Uh, have those conversations and what does that conversation look like yeah i think there's probably two ways to have them and i and i try to do both right there's the the more formal conversations and right so we have opportunities in performance reviews and your you know 90 day review and um, uh, if it's a new person to uh, to have those conversations and in a more formal setting and those can have value too i think i get probably the most value though out of informal conversation and working with the team and I can um, can talk to them at that time. So it doesn't have to be a, you know, sit down 30 minute, I'm gonna talk to you about your career goals. It could be, that's not bad. Um, but in the everyday work that we do, um, having conversations that aren't just focused on the project that you're working on right then, um, but asking some questions and, and getting to know um, your team members. You mentioned work-life balance, right? So even talking about things that are not work, uh, I think is uh, important. Uh, so, you know, find out, I, I know, you know, who on my team has uh, a family and who has a big event coming up and um, who, uh, you know, uh, is uh, focused on, um, you know, growing their career because now they have an opportunity. I have one individual who's, um, you know, uh, kids have moved all out of the house now. So they want to focus on uh, getting some uh, further education. And it's important for me to know that because then when I see opportunities come up, I can point them in that direction. And uh, then they see value in staying here because they know that there's opportunities here, but also that they have a leader that's going to help them to find those opportunities, right? I don't have the responsibility to make sure that everybody on my team like, achieves all their career goals. They have ownership in that too, right? But if I can do something, why would I not? And uh, then that helps them to see a future here because this is a place where you could grow. I know this is a place where people can grow, right? I already know that, but not everybody knows. showcase those um, opportunities. Oh, no, Melanie, I lost you there for a little bit, but I think we're back. Okay, um, yes. But I do want to come back to keeping talent. But I guess what I want to ask is, I think this is important for new managers, directors, and maybe it's different based on the position you're in. But trying to provide insights or if someone's let's just say a manager just a first time supervisor or manager the first time i'm be leading people okay. what's the hardest thing that the biggest struggle for new leaders when they first start having to lead people gosh um i could say that the biggest struggle is uh, is being able to navigate the relationship and um you know, especially when you're a first time leader, um, it's hard to make that transition from being uh, an individual contributor to the leadership role. And um, that's what I mean by navigate the relationship. There's just a different dynamic that exists there. 
and and that's sometimes difficult for people. So now, you know, you're the person that is responsible for providing the guidance to another person. Whereas maybe, you know, last week you were working right next to that person and you guys were on you know, equal footing. And I don't want to say it in a way that one person's better than another. They're not. But when you're in a leadership position, you have that additional responsibility. And so it's important that you take that responsibility and, um, own it and are and are doing that job right so um if we're peers i'm going to interact with you in a little bit different way than if i'm your leader so a lot of mistakes i see new leaders make is trying to still be peers when they're now the leader and um that never works out <laughs> it's 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 very difficult so i don't want to say you can't be friends with people on your team but really you can't be the same friends <laughs> that you were when you were their peers because you have a different role it's kind of like you know trying to be uh, friends with my daughter right um i hope that we have a good relationship and that we like each other and we interact well but ultimately i have the responsibility right i have a responsibility that she doesn't have and so it's important for that boundary to exist um, and for um, that relationship to not be the same as the relationship that she has with her girlfriends, say, right? And I think it's the same thing with the, um, the leader follower relationship is that, um, and, and, and in today's day, I, I think sometimes there's a negative connotation around that. What I just said, leader follower, it's, and I don't mean it in a negative way because I think I really think everybody has value in whatever position that they have. But when you have that ultimate responsibility, which you have as a leader, you have to have that boundary that exists so that you can lead your team and you can't have that same relationship. So I see a lot of of mistakes get made there. And I see also then because of the misunderstanding of the relationship that leaders um, don't. Um, don't make the decisions that they need to make or are afraid to have the difficult conversations that they need to have, or um, they just, it sets up this weird dynamic um, when you don't embrace that leader role and, um, and, and move out of being the peer to the team that, um, that you're leading. Um, I can relate a lot to that because I remember early in my career, because I think a lot about you know, you should try to think forward. So if you have a desire to be a manager or supervisor or whatever, it almost begins before that, as far as how you act with your peers, that that way there isn't this shock or weird adjustment when you are promoted, right? Because if there is, that's where it kind of gets, um, gets muddy. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, I, don't you think that people who are generally interested in moving up in leading people, they should probably be watching their behaviors and their interactions and relationships now so that it isn't that drastic of a difference when they do get promoted. I agree with that. Um, and I think that speaks in kind of all aspects, <laughs> I guess, of your life, right? Um, if you're, if you're uh, you know, in high school and you know you want to go into a professional job, right, you should be thinking about how you're, you know, how you present yourself and how you're presenting yourself to the world at that point, right? Um, today, right, um, we have social media and your email account. And you know, so just basic things like when I interview somebody and their email is something that is more typical of a high school student, I have a different impression of them, right? So if you're thinking of having a professional career, you should be thinking about that. What am I posting to my social media, um, right? Uh, because it's hard to make the, okay, I'm gonna suddenly go from being this person to now this other person. And I think that's what you're describing. I can't be this person today, but I wanna be a leader tomorrow. And then when I get that opportunity, I'm gonna suddenly change and become a right. different person. No, you're, you're probably not. Um, and or you're gonna have a hard time doing that in the minds of the people that are looking at who they're gonna progress into those roles, right? Um, so, um, you know, I encourage people when I'm, when I'm dealing with upper level leaders and they're looking at their teams, who there's gonna be their next leader, you should look for the people that are already leading. <laughs> and those are the people that get the roles. You don't become a leader with a role. You become a leader with or without the role, right? Leadership's not a title. It's um, do people follow you? And so I remember when I was in the restaurant business, I would go into one of our restaurants and sit and they'd say, you know, we really need a shift leader. And I just look around and I can point who's going to be your next shift leader. It's who all the other people are listening to already. 
they're already following this person. Um, so they already have that leadership. Um, so yeah, let's give them the title and we can develop them in areas where maybe they need some development, but people are already following them. They're already a leader, right? So to your point, I think you can be a leader without the title and that's probably our next leaders are the people that are already doing it um, uh, to some extent. And then we can more easily move them into that. Yep, absolutely. And you mentioned something that I did want to hit on, hmm. which we talked about social media, but I'm curious to know what's different in 2023 and looking forward for leaders versus in the past? Like, what, how has the environment changed that it's different if you want to be a true successful leader in any industry? I think that there's an irony there that I see. Um, and that is that you know, a lot of people will complain that today's younger workforce right, doesn't have the social skills that maybe other generations of workforce has. And they you know, blame social media and being on your computers and texting and you don't have as much social interaction. And maybe that is true. But the irony that exists for me that I kind of the dichotomy there is that I find that the workforce today needs more interaction from their leaders <laughs> than they maybe did in the past, right? So there's a lot of time I know that I spend and other leaders spend um, interacting with teams. They want more engagement. They want more recognition. They want um, uh, interactions from their leadership. They want coaching. Um, they, they, they want, you know, maybe not formal interactions, but that more casual interaction that can happen, more organic interaction. But, um, you know, that's interesting to me that that I see that and I spend so much time doing that where we complain that people aren't able to have interactions. Right. Uh, uh, so it's a it's an interesting thing that exists. But um, I do see that a lot. Whereas, you know, when I first started working and then even my parents and maybe it's because I come from that Marine Corps background. But we're just, you know, tell me what to do and I'll do it. And there's no, I got, you know, my paycheck is my recognition. I don't need any kind of interaction. Uh, and when I talk to old kind of, you know, old school leaders, that is more their style. But the workforce today is really looking for more than that. Um, they want more than like this transactional leadership. They want a relationship aspect to it and the interaction and engagement um, that um, a leader can bring. So the successful leaders today um, know how to build relationships and engage with their teams and their peers and engage up um, with their own leaders. Um, and that relationship aspect of leadership is really important. Yeah, and that's so well said. And another thing I wanted to touch on too was mentorship. That's a popular topic. A lot of times people say, how do I find a mentor? or things of that nature for you, what tips would you provide as somebody who is aspiring to learn from somebody, um, you know, have a mentor, any tips on that front? I encourage people to have mentors. I don't know if you need like a formal, like you don't need to sit down and sign a mentor agreement or, right, or anything right. like that, right? And you can have a, you can have a few mentors, right? Because there's people that are that are good at different things, right? So if I recognize in myself that I want to improve in this area, I want to find somebody that's good at that, right? First of all, um, but also I think what's really important in a mentorship relationship is having the um, trust with that person so that you guys can be honest with each other. Um, I have mentored a couple people um, here and that's what uh, the ones that have been really successful has been that where I can give you um, some very difficult feedback or a very direct feedback and we're still okay right, with each other. And you know, that's what I need too. If I have a mentor, I want somebody to tell me the honest truth. Right. And you know, maybe I'm dating myself, but I used to watch American Idol all the time. And I don't even know if it's still on anymore. But for me, I always always say, if I'm going up there and I want to be a singer, right? That's my goal. And I'm on American Idol, like which judge was the best judge to give feedback to me? Well, it was always going to be Simon, right? And again, I'm probably dating myself. And everybody said he's so mean. I'm like, I don't really care though about at that point because I'm trying to be a successful singer. I just need the truth. <laughs> I don't care about if you're nice or not. I want you to tell me, right? The worst judge would be somebody that would um, not give that to you, 
right? Because that's not helping you. And I used to always say, you know, so don't, if don't come after me, if you like this person a lot. And I, and she's probably a very nice person, but Paula Abdul was the worst judge for people who actually wanted to be successful. Cause you could get up there and be me who cannot sing at all. And she would say something like, oh, but your hair looks so great tonight. Like, well, great. I'm not looking to be a model. I'm looking to be a singer, right? So I need you to tell me how I'm singing. So when you're looking for a mentor, it's really important to find somebody who's willing to take the risk, right, of being honest with you and give you the feedback that you need. And by the way, you have to be ready to receive that feedback. Don't ask somebody to be your mentor if you're not okay with them telling you the truth, because that's the only way you're going to get better at whatever it is you're trying to get better at, right? So just be ready. You have a responsibility as a mentee <laughs> to receive feedback and be okay with that. Um, and, and so like, be okay with your mentor after that. Yeah. I think it was Simon Sinek who talked about like self-awareness, how it's kind of like not true in the sense of a lot of things people think like I can know myself just from my own interactions. It's like, you need the feedback to know your true self, right? It's really how others perceive you because in your head, your interactions may be way different. And I think that kind of candor and that feedback is definitely necessary. And it's yeah. funny you mentioned in uh, American Idol, I think of like Shark Tank. Do you watch Shark oh, Tank? Yeah. Yes, I do. So, so I imagine you're more of a Kevin O'Leary fan who's yes. a little more harsh. But he says the same thing. He says, I'm trying to set people up for success in the future. And yes. sometimes that might be a little harsh, but, you know. So well, you don't go on Shark Tank to make friends, right? You go on Shark Tank right. to be successful in your business, right? So uh, you, you have to, I think, focus on your goals. I'm not, if I, if, I don't know. I guess I'd find a different mentor if I was trying to feel better about myself. But that's not my goal when I find a mentor. I'm trying to improve on something, okay? So... Yep, absolutely. Um, Melanie, thanks for taking the time today. I have just a few more questions, a little quick in nature. Okay. Interview tips. So if there's one interview question, every candidate should be ready to answer, what would that interview question be? Oh, gosh. What do I ask everybody? Um, I ask everybody... Um, or maybe it's, it's not a question. Maybe it's just one thing that people need to be prepared for for an interview. I think you need to be prepared to give specific examples. And that's um, what I struggle with a lot. I'll ask a question and I'll get like the right answer, I guess. If there's a right answer, there's not really a right answer. But I'll get the, you know, generic academic answer. But I want to know um, a specific example. And if you could offer that, that would be great. Right. So don't make the interviewer work so hard to get to know you and uh, get information from you. Right. So um, your job in an interview is to talk about yourself and to um, uh, let the interviewer learn about you. Right. So I, you know, I've interviewed, I told you about my first job. Right? I interviewed from that point on. And one of the most frustrating things as an interview is when I have to work really hard uh, to get you to talk about yourself. Uh, yeah. So talk about yourself and, um, and be prepared to give some specific examples. So if I ask you, you know, what kind of leader are you? Don't give me the standard. I mean, you can start off with the standard pad answer of, oh, I'm a relationship leader and I interact with my team. Get, then give me an example of how you do that. Don't don't make me ask the question. I will ask the question. And then if you do make me ask it, you should have an answer. But just give it. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to something you said earlier as far as just like the relationship side of things. I think a lot of times in an interview, you want to understand what's it going to be like to work with this person. Mm -hmm. So if it's like this facade or this LinkedIn version, and you really can't communicate, then it's just uncomfortable, right? So I think yeah. that there's so much truth that bringing your true self and having specific examples of who you are, what you're good at, maybe what you need improvement. And I think that yeah. goes a long way. Yeah. Um, Work-life balance. So we talked about that a little bit earlier, but for you, how do you unplug? So how do you kind of step away and what helps you um, be better at who you are uh, at work? I think something I've really learned here in the past couple of years is to um, get rid of the the FOMO as a leader, right? And I actually just learned what that meant from my 22 year old daughter, the fear of missing out, <laughs> right? I don't have to be in every little thing that happens on my team or at San Manuel or any of that, right? Um, so it's okay for other people <laughs> to do stuff um, and for me to not know everything. And I think what goes along with that is that it's okay to say no. 
Um, and no is a complete sentence all by itself, right? You don't have to make excuse or give a reason necessarily. I mean, unless it's your boss is asking you maybe, but um, you, you, it, it's okay um, for someone to say, hey, would you like to do this? And for you to say, no, I don't think that's for me, right? Um, you can do that. Um, so it, it took me a really long time to learn that because I'm the person that wants to do everything and be involved in everything. And yeah, pick me. Um, but you just you don't have you don't have time for that. I'm very conscious today that every minute that I spend at my job is a minute I'm not spending with my family and doing the things that I love outside of work. So it has I have to spend the time here doing the things that are really impactful because that's the only way that's worth it for me. Right. I'm not going to come here and waste time because I could be spending time with my husband and my kids. Right. I'm giving that up <laughs> to do this. And I, I, I think it's a good trade because I also love doing this and I feel like I have impact here doing this. But you really have to um, to make yourself OK with that with that trade. And uh, so you really should be putting in your best effort and doing having the most impact you can have. Otherwise, I always say, what am I doing? I am giving up time with my husband to do what I, I better be working. I better be doing my job. <laughs> Otherwise I'm, I, I gave up that very valuable thing for not something that's very valuable. Yeah. And that's such a key point being intentional with your time and energy so that you could be, you know, your best, not only just at work, but at home. And I don't think it's ever a perfect mix, but I, but I think that's what you spoke about is like, you can say no, right. Picking your spots and understanding it's never perfect in an evolution, but the sooner you get a grasp on that, I think the better. Um, Melanie, thank you for taking the time today. I'm going to get you out of here on the last question we ask everybody, which is we're all about taking people's careers to the next level. So for you, if you were to provide three tips for anybody as far as how can I advance myself and be better in my position, take my career to the next level, what would those three tips be for you? Okay. So I thought about this a, a, a little bit because, and I kind of view that question more as what are three things that I wish everybody knew, right? Um, and when I think about that, I think about my daughter that I've mentioned a lot, right? Because I really look at her as my younger self. I don't know if she knows this, but so she's 22. And I think what are three things I wish she knew, right? I think the first thing that I wish she knew is how valuable she is. So I hope everybody knows that, um, that you have value and your job is to figure out where you could give that value the best, right? So you need to figure that out, um, but you have value. So don't, don't under, uh, you know, short sell yourself. Um, uh, number two, um, what we talked about earlier, that is about the journey, not the destination, right? So don't wait to be happy or passionate or to do a good job until you get your dream job. You could do it now, no matter what job you're in, um, you should be doing it now. And that's actually how you're going to be successful. Um, so do your best at the job you have now um, and, and, and you'll be successful. And then I think the third thing is always be um, open um, to learning and trying new things. Right? I, uh, I've used this example many times before, but I'll continue to use it because it's I, I love it. Um, and that is, uh, you know, if I wasn't open, right, to trying new things, if I tried vanilla ice cream, I would like it and I would stay there and I'd be probably fine, right? But I would never know if I didn't try other things that chocolate is my favorite, right? Um, so I need to try new things. And I, yeah, I will try the mango and decide that's not for me. But um, you only know that if you try, right? So you don't know what you don't know. Um, and that's an L and D saying. And so you have to like explore stuff. Um, so I encourage people to try new things. Um, and you know, if that's how you really find out what you truly are good at and where your value is, is by trying those things and, and you'll find it. There you have it. Three amazing tips. And I love tip number one, so simple, but I think everyone needs to know it. And I love the perspective you took on that question. So Melanie, thanks for taking the time today. I appreciate it. I know I found this valuable. I know our audience will. But once again, just thank you for taking the time. You're very welcome. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for asking me. All right, Melanie, have a good day. All right, you as well. Thanks, Kyle. Check out more episodes on nextlevelcasinocareers.com.